Right. All right. Hello. Hi, Dr. Sapp. This is Brian Stone. I'm with Dr. Carissa Sapp. And we're going to uh, talk today about her dissertation and her work. Um, do you mind to introduce yourself? So, as you said, I'm Dr. Sapp. Um, I live in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I'm an assistant principal at Lake Forest Middle School in Bradley County. I have been there for 24 years and have been in the assistant principal role for 18. Um, so, I have a pretty deep um, <laughs> knowledge of all things uh, middle school. Um, 11, 12, 13 year olds are my, are my jam. And um, I've learned a whole lot in, you know, just in all the years that, that I've spent working with them. Yeah, so you, you did uh, cyberbullying for your topic. Talk about that, and maybe how you came to that topic. I did because I was just seeing it and continue to see it um, more and more frequently. It's just become kind of that um, when we think about all the different things that plague middle schoolers, this is a more recent, like in the last decade, this has really become something that they have had to learn how to deal with. And I don't know that we're dealing with it very well. And so that's why I wanted to to research it and just see, because I wanted some practical application. Um, if I was going to spend so much time in research, I wanted to be able to actually use something that was of high interest to me and that would help me be a better advocate and um, leader for students. So that's that's why I selected cyberbullying. There wasn't there there is research about it but it's just it's it's varied and uh, a lot of it is lumped in with traditional bullying which is a a constant catchphrase in public education bullying is but cyberbullying has a little um you know some differences to it and i just i just really wanted to be able to figure out how to assist students in the best way with something that's often not even considered a school issue because a lot of times it happens outside of school. And so um, there's just all kinds of little corollaries that that come with it. But that was that's why I selected that. Yeah, I remember um, when we first talked about it, that you were like, I just I really want to help. I want to really get into this problem and do something that hasn't been done. So um, with the, the research, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I'll mention is that your dissertation won our Outstanding Dissertation Award. Um, and part of the reason I feel like is because you were so thorough. Um, what were some of the things that you learned in the literature review that lined up with what you were seeing in middle schools and maybe some of the things that were surprising? Well, one thing that I did um, throughout my, I, I picked my topic pretty early on. And so all the way through my coursework, anytime that I could study cyberbullying, that's what I did just to start that literature review and to feel like I was moving everything, you know, in one direction. Um, and so like in one of my, um, in one of my courses, I did a big study on the Tinker versus Des Moines and freedom of speech. And so that just went so well right into the historical side of cyberbullying and what's exactly allowed, you know, what are school administrators allowed to police and, um, you know, just, and that, and that was kind of my foundation as far as the history is concerned. Um, you know, the one thing I guess that was, I don't know that I had a whole lot of surprises in the in the literature review because I live it so much. So like the things that I read were, um, you know, pretty like, yep, that's that's how it is. But um, one thing that it kind of it confirmed that a lot of times kids can be, um, you know, tortured. There was one source, and I don't I don't have it in front of me, but I just remembered. I think he had been called out like on Twitter like 40 times and a judge still ruled that it wasn't, um, you know, harassment. 
and, and it's just been interesting to me how, you know, different judges, it's still such a gray area that some, there's not a hard and fast, like if you do this, then it's always this. Um, there's not really that kind of ruling on it as far as in the court system. And there's so many just um, caveats and just that gray area of if it's, um, you know, how much a school can actually do. And typically courts rule in favor of schools, but sometimes, you know, they don't. And so there's, that was, that part was interesting to me. The one thing in my findings that was surprising to me was because I did seven case studies um, with seven middle school students. And one thing that was very surprising to me was how all of them felt that having a trusted adult was such an important factor in their being able to deal with cyberbullying. And I never would have thought, I would not have predicted that 12 and 13, 12, 13, 14 year olds would have admitted that, even if it were true, that the, because in middle school, there's that big division between, um, you know, your peers and your parents. And you don't really want the two, the two to intersect. You want to be so independent, the children do. And for them to say, no, it, it makes a big difference just knowing that I had somebody to talk to about it or somebody that would you know, help me you know, through it. That, that was probably the most surprising piece to me because I felt that was true. But um, like I say to my students, I'm an old lady. And so I know that you know, they don't often see the things like, like I do. I mean, I know that it's important to have a trusted adult in your corner, but for them to actually speak that and say, yeah, we need to have, um, you know, an adult that we feel like listens to us and takes us seriously. Um, that was, I think, my most surprising piece. And with that um, finding, uh, have you been able to, with the turbulence uh, of the pandemic, have you been able to kind of talk to your teachers at your middle school about that? We talk about relationships um, regularly, like that's what makes or breaks a middle school educator is the ones who are able to make, to make those professional relationships. And th those, I mean, the kids are drawn to those teachers who have that ability to do that. So we talk about relationships all the time. If you're going to manage a, a middle school classroom, you've got to be able to have relationships with your students, because if you're a tyrant, they're not going to respond to that. And you don't, I mean, if you're an educator of any quality, you don't want students responding to you out of fear. You want them responding to you, you know, out of mutual respect. And that mutual respect comes about through, you know, through that relationship piece. So for the past four years or so, I have highly encouraged our staff to select five students that they would just focus on for the year and not not any you know nothing monetary or anything like that but just talk to them when you see them when you're walking to lunch strike up a conversation you know just be a part of their you know daily dialogue of how are you doing how was your fall break how was your where did you go you know this summer or you know how, how are your grandparents or just you know just conversations really was all that I've asked them to do and just and I've had so many do that. We have about 80 teachers. And so to think that you could impact 400 kids, you know, in a year in a positive way where they felt like they had that true connection. So that has been um, a driving just little thing of mine, you know, for the past four, four years or so. And then, um, and so then with this, relationships have just become, you know, a critical piece of you know, of the, of the pandemic and keeping kids engaged in education and wanting to learn is that piece because a lot of, you know, kids may be out for 10 or 14 days at a time or sometimes longer. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had kids out for even longer than that, you know, for, the, for them to feel like that they had a connection with someone. And that was our advantage back last year whenever the school shut down in March was that those relationships had already been formed. Oh, yeah. And so whenever we went to virtual education, at least, you know, they knew that the teacher's face and name and kind of how they operated. And so that, that was definitely an advantage. One of my greatest concerns about this past fall was if we weren't able to open the doors 
how would we form relationships virtually when the parents had never met the teacher mm -hmm. and the students had never met the teacher in person? How would we do that? And I was just so thankful that we were able to return in person. Yeah. And I thought, even if we can only return for two weeks or you know three weeks, let's just go back long enough to get that relationship piece in place. And then if we have to go virtual, then, you know, at least we've got faces and names and all of that intact. But thankfully, you know, we've been able to stay in schools, you know, for the duration of the year. So, um, but that relationship piece is, is so important. And I've, I have found myself just um, spending more time with individual students and really trying to be their advocate and, you know, their, their check-in point. Mm -hmm. um, especially this year, you know, reaching out to some of my students who I know have adverse childhood trauma and, you know, some things like that. And just being that person where, you know, I say, okay, especially new students, I introduce myself, you know, you know, I'm, I'm Dr. Sapp. I want you to remember that name. Like I've even pointed like to my nameplate on my desk. I'm the person you come to if you need help, like just so that they would have that connection. And I had I had a child who immediately even the next day she started coming to see me every morning. I was her to like check in unofficial. There was no you know, this was not an uh, official thing that I it just happened. And she just started coming to see me every morning before homeroom, like just to tell me just what happened the night before, you know, mm -hmm. what happened at home and, and that kind of just making that that connection where the child feels seen and um, and that you know, that they have somebody to, somebody to talk to. And then I just, I think that that's, with so much in the pandemic of us being isolated and, you know, we, we can't touch and we can't, you know, we have to socially distance and just all those things. I think any effort we can make, you know, to cross that um, in any way that we can, you know, to create that relationship is huge. Yeah, that's what, when I think of kind of the adolescent development stuff, it, it makes so much sense to me when they're in that phase of kind of like finding their own identity, but still kind of under the rules of the parent. They do need kind of some other adult in their life that they can kind of feel at least regard for and from. Right. One of the one of the things that. One of the things that was cool for me in your dissertation, one of the surprises, it wasn't true of all seven cases, but you had a couple students who had engaged in peer, uh, maybe a peer counseling, is that the right word? Yeah, I have one student who's even set up like an unofficial, um, she calls it a suicide hotline, but, um, and her, you know, her guardian is aware that she does this, but somehow online through social media, she set up a way that people can contact her and she's had other teenagers and other adults even, you know, call and just talk to her about things that they've, you know, that, that they're feeling and, you know, to talk about, you know, how they've been bullied. And, you know, I had another one of the, another student in the, in the case study, um, she became a moderator for one of the social media sites where she could, um, members could reach out to her if someone was being unkind to them online and then she would report it, you know, back to an administrator. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that was, that was another interesting finding. And I think that it's, you know, that's an effective, if it can be done properly, that's an effective way to teach other students how to treat students is whenever you have someone who has actually endured cyberbullying, you know, be your spokesperson, you know, for the cause. It's a lot more powerful than if it's just somebody talking about something that they've heard or read, if it's actually, you know, a, a life experience. Yeah, and, and, you know, in teacher education, I've heard over the years, like, professors who've never been in the classroom just aren't respected by students. Like, they just don't listen. So if you haven't lived it, you haven't been in it, why would you? I think that's kind of a natural tendency. Um, so, so, yeah, what else uh, would you add, kind of like, uh, do you have uh, future goals or, or whatever for the research or just kind of with PD for the school or, or what? You know, I've thought about, you know, submitting some research, uh, you know, to journals or to present a lot of the, the typical professional development that I've participated in in the past 
has, has been virtual or non-existent this year, you know, just because of the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I have gone to the AMLE conference many years and, um, and even our local, we have a, a Tennessee Association of Middle Schools within the state and I've presented at that before. Um, and that's not happening again this year, you know, because of the, the pandemic that we're experiencing. But, um, but I would like, you know, to, to share those kinds of things and get it in some kind of format um, so that it, you know, makes a difference for more, you know, just me and, and what I do. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I think we talked about that AMLE conference. Um, yeah, I've seen, I did, a, I just did a virtual conference. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's definitely not the same. Well, uh, is there anything else that, that you would share about the dissertation or? Um, I, don't, I don't really think so. Um, I was just looking here at some of the things that, another thing that was surprising to go back to that, that I had, I had forgotten was parental monitoring. I, that was another thing that surprised me that they admitted that if parents are monitoring their social media, that that was actual, actually helpful um, for them because, you know, most teenagers are kicking and screaming if, you know, if there's any kind of adult monitoring or input in that, but they actually, you know, appreciated the fact that parents were in tune, you know, with, with what they were doing. So I think that's another important you know, important piece. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was great work. Um, I enjoyed reading it. Uh, so yeah, I hope that you get a chance. Uh, it's not like you've got a lot of free time uh, running a middle school and uh, with your family and everything. But uh, yeah, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk about it today. Yeah, thank you. All right.